and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our final webinar on CASA's draft advisory circular 139V-01, guidelines for birdie port design. If you do have any questions today, please add them in the chat and the team will endeavour to answer them during our question time at the end of the presentation. Uh, the chat function should be on now. Here in Australia, it is a sign of respect to acknowledge our traditional custodians. For myself here in Perth, those traditional custodians of the southwest of WA are the Noongar people. So accordingly, on behalf of CASA, I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which our offices are located and the places to which we travel for work. We also pay our respects to the elders, past and present, as well as those who are emerging. I'd like to extend my acknowledgement and respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and any other First Nations people joining us today. For those of you that were not able to join us for the first three webinars, I would like to quickly introduce you to our CASA team that are developing the Vertiport framework. My name is Liam Smith and I am the Vertiport specialist for the team. Joe Hain is our team leader for future aerodromes and Dan Parsons is a senior standards officer for aerodromes and heliports. Also online with us today is Sarah Gutler from our stakeholder engagement team. I just want to take a moment to thank Sarah for her assistance to the Vertiport team. Uh, Sarah and the SED team are the ones that have done all of our social media posts and promotion. They're the ones that have sent out the reminders and they coordinated the whole webinar series. So a big thank you is well deserved. OK, so today is the last of our four webinar series on the advisory circular. The previous webinars covered uh, an overall introduction that was presented by Joe back in December. That was followed by a presentation on physical characteristics in January. And the third was last fortnight with Dan that was covering the Vertiport OLS. All three of the previous webinars are available on CASA Briefing YouTube channel, and this one will join them in a few days time. The QR code will send you off to the CASA Briefing YouTube channel. What do we want to try and achieve today? By the end of today's presentation, we kind of hope that you will have an understanding of each of the marker, marking and lighting elements, get some idea of the rationale behind our approach to the specifications of each of the different visual aids, and understand the key characteristics of each. So we'll be covering our general approach to visual aids, and then we'll cover each of the visual aid elements, which are wind indicators, markers and markings, and lighting. And then we'll get some time at the end for some question time with Dan. OK, so what was our mindset as we worked through the visual aid specifications? Firstly, we wanted it all to be easier. The annex has been added to as technology has changed. But unfortunately, this has made some of the visual aids SARPs long winded and honestly, in some areas, a little confusing. So that was a really important consideration for us. Let's keep this easy to understand. Secondly, we wanted to try and future proof the guidance as much as we could. We know that things are going to change in this developing AAM space, so we had to consider that. Most importantly, Wherever we could, we wanted the specifications to be outcome based. As such, only where we felt it was really needed have we used descriptive specifications. So where there's things like a color or a line width. Okay, the first element of visual aids in, in the visual aids chapter is the wind direction indicator. And we decided to make this one optional. Why do we do that? The first reason is we expect that when VCAs get certified, that they should have a constant digital awareness that comes from many different sources, such as onboard sensors, vehicle to vehicle or V2V awareness. Things like photo conditions, automated weather station data, maybe even stand availability. They might be streamed directly from Vertiport automation systems. Aeronautical information could be coming from all sorts of sources from providers of services UAM, air navigation service providers, and supplemental service data suppliers. 
Secondly, well, eventually we're looking at a future where there may be no pilot to look at a wind indicator anyway. However, if the vertiport operator chooses for a wind indicator to be provided, or more importantly, if a VCA operator requires a vertiport to have a wind indicator, then the characteristics are a sleeve that is 1.2 metres long by 0.3 metres wide, and the colour should be simply contrasting to its surroundings. Moving into the larger section of markers and markings. The general specification in place for markers and markings are simple and performance based. And we have said markers and markings need to be clearly visible. So what does that mean? It means having a color that contrasts with the background or having a border or box to ensure the visibility of the marking. We'll show some examples of that later on. In addition, we've said that nighttime visibility may be supplemented either with reflective or refractive material such as glass beads, or as technology becomes available, perhaps things like electroluminescent paint become an option. OK, so we're going to go now and look through our specific, uh, sorry, marking specifications, and we'll be working through them in order presented in the AC. So we're starting with flight path alignment guidance marking. These are used where it is desirable and practical to indicate available approach and or departure paths. The dimensions for the arrow, we kept consistent with the Annex 14 Volume 2, so there are no surprises there. The guidance marking may be a single direction or a bi-directional arrow aligned with the flight path. The arrow should be marked in white and can be located within the telof, the FATO and or the FATO protection area. In this illustration, we can see that the ground is a very light coloured concrete, for example. So our vertiport operator has had all the markings outlined by a contrasting black line. The next marking as we work from the outside in is the FATO perimeter marking or markers. The FATO perimeter marking should be used where the extent of the FATO is not self-evident. Now, this is the first time that we've come across the wording of when not self-evident. So what do we mean by that? If your FATO is clearly visible against the surrounding landscape, such as in this first illustration, a cleared earth FATO against a grassed area, clearly showing the FATO area. Otherwise, the photo should be outlined by either flush in-ground markings, sorry, flush in-ground markers, or markings that are one and a half metres by one by 0.3 metres in white. Where the photo has straight edges, then the corners should be defined by the markings, and the spacing between the ends of the markers or markings should be one and a half to two metres. Moving in again, we get to our telof. Once again, we've used that wording of if not self-evident. So a paved telof within a grass photo like this illustration need not be marked. But if the telof is not self-evident, then the telof should be outlined by an unbroken white line 0.3 metres in width. As we discussed in webinar two, the telof is the area defined for the touchdown or liftoff of a VCA. While we're here, let's compare the last two markings we've just covered with markings of an airport. A runway strip and a FATO are both marked by broken white markings. In the case of an airport, these are usually gables. These markings have the same purpose. They show the area that is prepared for the safe containment of an aircraft in the event of a deviation. A runway edge marking and a telof marking both have the same unbroken white line defining the area for touchdown. So the telof marking defines the area for touchdown, but it is the touchdown positioning marking or TDPM that essentially marks the guide so it's the essential marking to guide the pilot 
to aligning the VCA correctly within the TLOF. The TDPM is also used within a stand, but we'll cover that use later. There are two types of touchdown positioning marking, the circle and the shoulder line. Both are intended to be used by a pilot to align their seat over the marking, thus ensuring that the VCA's undercarriage is contained within the TLOF and the VCA extremities are safely contained within the FATO. Where there is no or limit to the orientation of the VCA within the TLOF, then the marking should be the Touchdown Positioning Circle or TDPC. The TDPC will always have an internal radii of 0.25 design D, which originates at the centre of the TLOF. Unfortunately, there is sometimes still a lack of understanding of the purpose of a TDPM in the helicopter world, where pilots align and position themselves over the heliport H marking instead of over the TDPM. The second form of TDPM is the shoulder line. This marking can be supplemented with an alignment line to provide lateral guidance. Same as the TDPC, the center of the inner edge of the shoulder marking should be located 0.25 design D from the center of the TLOF. This example demonstrates possible shoulder markings for a dual direction positioning, with the designation number showing the correct shoulder line for each approach direction. Currently in the helicopter world, it's not very common to see shoulder line markings within a FATO like we've shown here. More commonly, they are used within a stand. So we'll see this marking pop up, pop up again soon. The next marking is the aiming point marking. These are used when a FATO is provided where there is no touchdown liftoff area. So a VCA will arrive and depart from a hover and transition to a separate TLOF elsewhere. Being consistent with the Annex 14 Volume 2, the equilateral triangle should be white with nine metre sides and have lines that are one metre wide. Where there is a preferred approach direction, then the triangle should be aligned to that direction. Now for the central marking, the vertiport identification marking. This is part of the vertiport marking that the team very early on wanted to take a new direction on. The FAA and Europe have two completely different takes on the vertiport identification marking. Now, we could have chosen one of them and just put that in the AC, but we asked ourselves what the purpose is of this marking. It's not going to be used to guide an aircraft to the vertiport. Let's be realistic. Even though this first AC assumes initial operations by VCAs with a pilot on board flying visual operations, we all know that the location of the destination vertiport is going to be a set of coordinates in a computer. So we don't need a three metre tall marking for that. It's not needed to show where there is a desired flight path to the FATO. We have a flight path alignment guidance marking that does that more clearly. And it's not there to show a pilot safe alignment for positioning to touchdown. That's what the touchdown positioning marking is for. So it's more about identification. And if we're going to be looking for VCAs to be autonomous in the future, then really it's going to be identification for the passengers of their destination. The other scenario we envisaged is the AAM concept paper image of a cityscape full of vertiports on roofs. How boring would it be to have all the same logo on every single rooftop? And from a corporate perspective, what a disappointing loss of opportunity it would be for you not to be able to shout out your brand to passengers flying past your building. So we decided let's open the floor to allow something better. So long as the logo does not conflict the touchdown positioning circle when it's used, uh, when the touchdown positioning circle is used, uh, and essentially that it fits inside the touchdown positioning circle, anything that identifies the vertiport and has a form that allows it to be readable when aligned with a preferred approach direction is acceptable. Apart from an H or an X, as these are already used for heliport identification and for indicating unserviceability respectively. So, you may choose to use the FAA broken wheel. 
or you could use EASA's V on blue. But maybe you prefer your company brand, or perhaps it is the logo for your medical facility. Maybe you want to identify your hotel chain or your shopping complex. Or maybe it's for a verde port at an orchard down in WA's lovely Margaret River region. We do also allow for multiple photos to have ordinal numbers to supplement the verde port ID marking. So a verde port operator has been asked to build a verde stop on each of these three towers in Sydney, and they've opted to use the ASA V as the verde port ID marking for all of them. Today is the first time ever that St George's Bank Board is jumping on a VCA and flying in. Unfortunately, this is not going to set a good mood for the board meeting today. They really wanted their Verdi stop to stand out from their neighbours. So let's do that for them. And while we're at it, we can make the other tower Verdi stop stand out better too. So here we go. Corporate logos, corporate colours to each of the Verdi stops to stand them out. For each one, the TDPC still stands out. The TLOF area is clearly identifiable, as is the FATO edge. But each one is unique, identifies one from the other, and it's just what the board members wanted. Now we have happy board members and everyone's going to get a Christmas bonus. OK, another way to identify the VertiPort may be using a VertiPort name marking. This can be an actual name, or it can be its designator. Characters should be not more than 1.2 metres in height, and if work used at night, should be illuminated. There are no other restrictions on the location, or the font, or the colour, or the orientation. We've also included the option to add max weight and delimitation markings. Again, we've tried to keep these simple uh, specifications simple. They should be no less than 0.6 metres in its longest dimension and located within the photo or TLOF. Weight should be shown in tonnes with one decimal place, followed by a lowercase t, and the D value should be in metres to the nearest whole metre. Moving on to the taxiways and taxi routes. The specifications for VertiPort taxiway markings are the same as for all taxiways under Annex 14. A continuous yellow 15 centimetre wide, centimetre wide marking centred on the taxiway. If you have a taxiway or an air taxi route over a surface that won't accommodate paint markings, then flush in-ground markers that are 1.5 metres long by 15 centimetres wide can be placed and spaced appropriately to indicate the centre line. The last part of the marking section is for the stands. The stand should have a few marking elements. The touchdown position marking, being either a circle or shoulder bars, should be used within the stand to provide a stop position, even if touchdown and liftoff is not permitted within the stand. The TDPM and any associated alignment markings are important to ensure that the VCA is safely contained within the boundary of the stand. That stand boundary should be marked by a perimeter line that is yellow and 15 centimetres in width. We've also provided specifications for lead in and lead out lines, designation markings and limitation markings as well. In the AC, we provided what we hope is a helpful guide on all the different dimensions and some of the possible variations of stand markings that might be possible. All right, moving on to the lighting part of visual aids. The most important part of our general lighting specifications is the photometrics. We've used the wording that they should be appropriate to the vertiport environment and intended operations without being visually distracting or confusing to pilots. So what do we mean by this? 
there needs to be consideration of different factors. Where is your vertiport going to be located? Is it in a city centre surrounded by neon lights? Or within the inner suburbs where extraneous light could disturb nearby residents? Or are you putting a vertiport in a country town where there is no light pollution and a low light system could be seen for miles? What are the intended flight operations going to be? Will pilots need to acquire the light of the lights of the vertiport from 10 miles out or just a few? What approach profiles will the VCAs be flying? Traditionally, aerodromes have been built on large open areas, generally outside of city centres, where a certain intensity and colour of lighting for a particular part of the aerodrome, like say runway edge lights, will provide a very similar outcome from one aerodrome to the next. But that's not what we're envisaging for vertiports. So when the team went to look at the lighting ISO Candela charts in the annex, to potentially add it to the AC, we just didn't think that the chart provided intensities and elevations that might be suitable for every vertiport situation. Let's consider elevation characteristics of the lights for a moment. Photo lights are intended to allow for acquisition, initial acquisition of from a distance. So the intensity of the light should be high enough and be projected at an appropriate elevation to allow for that acquisition. But having that same elevation profile for a TLOF light, when an aircraft is likely to be close in and in vertical flight over TLOF, that might create what's known as the black hole effect. So the TLOF lights would not need to be as bright as a photo light, but they would need to be visible from a higher elevation. The other philosophy we wanted was we wanted each light to be used for a particular purpose. Light colour, sorry. Each light colour to be used for a particular purpose. That way the pilot knows what part of the vertiport they are looking at. The initial acquisition of and guidance to the vertiport is indicated by white lights, the photo perimeter lights, the flight path alignment lights, or the aiming point lights all serve as raw guidance to the FATO. Next, you'll be looking for green lights. They'll be defining the TLOF, or they'll be showing the air taxi route away from the FATO towards the TLOF. The yellow lights then provide alignment for your touchdown, and from, and from there, alignment for taxi. And lastly, the stands are lit by floodlights. Let's go through each of the elements. Once again, we're going from the outside in. The first lighting system is the flight path alignment guidance lights. This light system should be a line of three to five white omnidirectional lights that should be inside the flight path alignment marking. So far, this is consistent with Annex 14, Volume 2. But we asked ourselves a question. If we need to have a marking to indicate single direction flight paths, then how would a pilot know which direction they could and could not fly uh, from a single line of omnidirectional lights? We considered a few solutions, things like directional lights or showing different colours front to back, but we settled on adding a short three light barrette between the last to second last light. Keeping the lights omnidirectional was important as it means the direction of the arrow could be seen when approaching from any direction. We think this is a sensible solution, but please, the point of the consultation is let us know what you think. Uh, put it in the consultation if you think this uh, solution works or if you don't. Now, if we could have made any of the lights mandatory, it would have been this but the guidance nature of the AC means we couldn't do that. So anyway, the photo perimeter lights are white omnidirectional lights spaced evenly up to five metres apart. They are located outside and within three metres of the photo edge. And for photos with straight edges, there should be a light at the end of each light. Because these lights are located in the photo protection area, 
they should be no more than 25 centimeters in height and they need to be frangibly mounted. But obviously, if the VCAs are taxiing to and from the FATO, then the lights would need to be inset. The last of the white light, uh, the white light light systems is the aiming point lights. These six white omnidirectional lights need to be located within the aiming point marking with the lights spaced equally on each side as shown. OK, moving into the TLOF. We've grouped perimeter lights and TDPC lights together, giving the option of using either or both within the TLOF. As I said, our preference would have been to make photo lights mandatory, but the next best thing was to try and infer this by allowing the TLOF light systems to be omitted if the TLOF is centrally located within a photo which is already lit. TLOF perimeter lights have a nice simple specifications. They are green, omnidirectional, and spaced three meters apart or less, outside of but within 3.3 meters of the TLOF edge. Same as with the photo lights, straight edges should have a light at the end of each edge. And like the photo perimeter lights, these should also be inset if there is a taxiway associated with the TLOF. TDPC lighting segments. This was another area of the annex that was exceptionally confusing in terminology, with there being different types of TDPC lights with different names, like arrays of segmented point source lighting or luminescent panels, and each of them having different specifications. Trying to figure out which specifications related to which light type is sometimes not a simple task. So we wanted to simplify the section by referring to them as a whole, but what to call them. Thankfully, our colleagues at the UK State CAA had already led the way in this topic in their CAP 3, uh, 437 standard for offshore helicopter landing areas. In that CAP, they use the terms lighting element and lighting segment. So we took their explanations from CAP 437 and created our definitions around those. So a light segment is the actual lighting fixture, which consists of both the frame or housing plus a line of lighting elements. Those lighting elements are the source of light. Now they can be single sort light sources, such as the example on the slide, which has four light elements within the lighting segment. Or they could be a continuous light source, such as fiber optic cable or an electroluminescent panel. So the specifications for TDPC lighting relate to the lighting segment, not to the lighting element. Lighting segments for the TDPC should blend into the marking. This means being the same color as the TDPC marking. They should have a width less than the marking width. To create a pattern such as the circle for the TDPC, the segment should make up 50 to 75% of the marking shape, evenly spaced, and located within 10 centimeters of the inner edge of the TDPC. And because the TDPC is yellow, the lighting emitted by the lighting elements should also be yellow. As we've said at the beginning of the lighting discussion, the photometrics for vertiport lighting need to be appropriate for the intended operation. So for TDPC lighting elements, the lux output should likely be less than that for photo lights or the TLOF perimeter lights because a pilot will be operating so much closer and focusing on them to align correctly for touchdown. Moving away from the photo and onto the taxiways. This one is a bit of a change. We have deliberately suggested that taxiway lights be yellow rather than green, where your vertiport only supports ground taxi or tow. If your taxiway supports air taxiing, then the light should be alternating green and yellow. So what was our rationale behind this suggestion? It starts with our philosophy of colors having a purpose. We wanted our guidance to be obvious that the only green lights are used for defining the teal off or to show an air taxi route 
to a TLOF. Once within the TLOF, the pilot will be acquiring yellow lights of the TTPC to align for touchdown, and then they will be aligning with a taxiway, which has the same color. We also wanted to keep the taxiway center line color consistent day to night. We think this makes sense. This is probably one of the big divergences that we've made that not everyone's going to agree with, but then that's the point of our consultation. Please jump onto the consultation hub. Let us know, do you like this change or not? Does it make sense? If so, why? If it doesn't, if not, why not? Lastly, we arrive at our stand, which should be lit if used at night. We provide some more outcome-based specifications here. Provide adequate illumination with minimum glare. Arrange your lights so there are minimum shadows. Make sure that the horizontal and vertical illuminant, illumin, sorry, <laughs> illuminance is sufficient for manoeuvring and positioning and, keep, and for keeping personnel safe during operations. Some of you with a heliport background might have noticed that the AC doesn't provide specifications for floodlights to be used for FATOs or TLOFs. Yes, this was deliberate. When we looked into the research done by others into heliport lighting, it was shown that floodlights weren't the industry best practice for lighting FATOs or TLOFs. But clearly we are suggesting that floodlights are the safest option for turnaround operations. So here's some food for thought. What happens if you have a simple verti stop that is just a FATO TLOF and nothing else, but you intend to operate it at night? How would you address both aspects, the flight and the turnaround? What would you do to satisfy the safest outcome for arrivals, departures and for turnaround operations? And lastly, we've tried to look forward to the future of visual aids. As such, we have added in the specification that says that machine readable aids are not precluded in the AC. We have seen QR codes being used in drone operations for a little while now. However, it was great to find this photograph from Volocopter while I was doing the preparation for this presentation. It clearly shows a QR code marking within the TLOF. We don't know what visual or non-visual aids may be needed in the future of AAM. So this is our way of covering, at least for now, possible new options for machine readable visual aids. Well, that concludes our presentation part of today. I hope you've added a whole heap of great questions for Dan to answer. So hopefully Dan will jump on screen and uh, start going through some of those. If you haven't added anything to the questions, Now's the time to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Liam. Um, I have had plenty of questions and I've been uh, typing away feverishly. Uh, what I might do is, uh, even though there's still a few more questions coming through, I'll just quickly go through my answers for those that haven't been monitoring the chat and for the video and prosperity reasons. Um, we did have some question uh, or an initial question from Paul regarding uh, potential interference between the uh, a branded logo as the identification marking and the TDPC. Um, and I pointed out that the specification in the advisory circular does require that there not be any conflict or detraction from the TDPC with the identification marking. And uh, fair play to Paul here, uh, he did come back at that with uh, a, a pretty common feedback we've received with many of our um, specifications in that there is a seems like some gray area in those words Con conflict or detraction what does that mean um, well it, it means what it means to any given particular verti port and this is the basis of our outcome based approach overall so a verti port owner operator should work with their potential users um, at least initially and their ongoing users after that to ensure that what they implement at the Verdi port will work for their users. The um, upshot is that that engagement is great for safety overall, and definitely when we get to our operations AC, that'll be a, a theme. We will be pushing through the uh, the life of a Verdi port. But also at this point, that interaction will ensure that the Verdi port is suitable for all the potential users of that Verdi port operator uh, wants to attract and, and maintain. So hopefully, um, we got to the bottom 
uh, of that particular question there for Paul. Um, Catherine then uh, asked the question about the opposite. Can you just leave the centre of the uh, TDPC um, open? Um, and you, you can. The AC is uh, guidance only, um, and it is a may in the specifications as well. So you could leave the TDPC um, just black or whatever the surface colour is um, underneath it. Uh, if there's no need or requirement for anything more, that's fine. Um, Roger asked about uh, extra lighting. Um, and for example, I think looking at um, uh, carrier unique landing aids and, and honestly, I read that and I thought about other types of guidance, either vertical guidance or approach guidance. Um, for a lot of those aspects, we left that reserved for now, or at least didn't acknowledge it. Um, we're happy to watch the industry grow these particular systems and, and what they need to use. So definitely anything character uh, carrier specific or user specific, uh, I'll again go back to the question, uh, to the answer of um, VertiPod operators working with their users or potential users to provide them what they need so that the VertiPod operates uh, as the VertiPod operator would like it to operate. Um, Rex uh, put forward uh, his recommendation uh, and an absolutely justifiable recommendation that a windsock is always a great idea as a backup. Um, I have no problem with that uh, as a position that a VertiPort operator may take, and that's why we included the specification. So even though we haven't mandated the requirement or at least even necessarily recommended it within the AC, um, we have specifications there, so if a VertiPort operator does want to provide that extra layer of safety, we've uh, given them some specifications that we believe is appropriate for a VertiPort. So thank you, Rex. Actually, I've got a couple here from Rex. Um, about uh, The next one was about water-based VertiPorts, and this goes back to the second webinar. Our physical characteristics requirements for FATOs is for them to be solid. So whilst the FATO may exist within a body of water itself, it will be a solid surface. Uh, as Liam has pointed out here, that doesn't necessarily require a TLOF. It can have an aiming point marking in the middle, uh, at which point the aircraft would transition to an air taxi to a TLOF uh, within the parking positions. Um, Simon brings up a good point. Thank you, Simon, about uh, heliport and vertiport specifications, why not just bring them all together? We have relied heavily on VertiPort, oh, sorry, Heliport standards. Um, and at this stage, uh, for reasons brought up in the first webinar about trying to be flexible to this growing industry and be somewhat dedicated to its needs for now, we do have on our agenda to look at harmonization on a longer term. So. Uh, I agree that there's not really a great longer term argument for these two sets of specifications. Um, but as, uh, as stated for now, we're looking to be somewhat specific to work neatly in with this developing industry, but uh, the harmonization will remain on the books uh, as this continues to mature. Now, uh, now the new questions. So this will be on the fly. My apologies if it just takes me a moment. Um, Rex has asked about how different colour paints register on the albedo rating scale, and this incumbent, uh, becomes important when using night vision systems where some colours blend together. That sounds really cool. Um, and I would probably have to go back to the group and discuss whether our AC, which at the start establishes that this is for piloted VCA operations in visual conditions, is even considering NVGs at this stage. My gut feel is no, but that is definitely something we would need to keep in mind if any sort of um, night vision augmentation system is employed in an aircraft, which is definitely something that, that could be used at a later stage. So uh, we're going to take that bit of feedback, Rex, and have it on our list of things to consider as this uh, AC matures and develops as the operations mature and develop. Um, Clem has asked about whether we expect VertiPorts to be able to be dual use with helicopters, and if so, does this change the guidelines? Um, it doesn't change the guidelines, 
Uh, we don't expect anything to be anything, if that sounds over uh, redundant. Um, the owner of the Vertiport or Heliport, um, what they intend to do with that space will be guided by a whole range of factors. One will be this AC, one would be AC 139R-01. And then ultimately for the helicopter space, the decision maker will be the helicopter operator as to whether that facility is uh, acceptable to them from a safety point of view. Um, and that's the CASA picture. I, there is also, and Clem is very well aware of the other picture around land use planning and approvals um, that, that we don't necessarily get into the middle of. But uh, hopefully that gets to the, the decision-making process that might exist in that area, Clem. Um, Mark has questioned the outcome-based photometrics um, as being challenging from a design perspective, and uh, it might lead to some questionable design solutions um, versus the standard HELO criteria. Um, we understand that. Um, as Liam explained, though, we felt that there was some risk in the standard HELO criteria in potentially some circumstances that vertiports are being uh, suggested will exist and hence why we pulled back to the outcome based. We understand and, and we've acknowledged in I think nearly every webinar that outcome based specifications are harder to implement when you try and deal with the um, immense variety of uh, environments in which mm -hmm. these particular facilities will exist. So um, it will be up to Vertiport owners and operators uh, as essentially the key element here, and then eventually the aircraft operators to assure themselves within their safety or risk management systems, um, whether that's a regulated system or just good business practice, uh, that the design or the, the uh, implementation of those lights meets their requirements. And those requirements are to operate safely. So we definitely acknowledge that aspect, that challenging aspect of outcome-based uh, specifications overall, um, but within the, the large variety of environments we're expecting and the variables that we're not aware of, uh, we didn't feel we had the position to start honing in on specifics in that area. Um, uh, Yasushi-san has asked about the type of approach and departure. If vertical approach and departure is approved, do we need to find new visual aids? Uh, this gets to Liam's comments regarding not just the photometrics, but the elevations of uh, the lighting, so the, the light profile. And whether a vertical procedure is used, then those considerations need to be made uh, with respect to those lighting outputs. And again, this is where the outcome-based approach exists. Even the uh, in Liam's description, the traditional photo lighting of something like a uh, three to seven degree max um, illuminance may not be suitable in a case where the vertiport is within an obstacle rich environment that might just be shining into the neighbor's eyes, in which case something with a more of a vertical profile up around the 85 to 90 degrees would be more suitable. So hence the specifications being outcome based uh, will fit within uh, those varieties of flight paths and flight maneuvers. Uh, thank you, Pauline. I think you've added into Mark's uh, question there, and and I would agree that that's the the assurance. We will speak to Vertiport operators in this particular AC later on. CASA requirements. We'll speak to aircraft operators. So we'll tend to use the language of assurance for those people. Um, but of course, the flip side of that is when somebody is seeking assurance, the designer will have to put forward proof of uh, that their design meets those outcomes. Um, would moving array lights, this is from Behram, uh, or brightness dimming be an aid for landing flight paths to manage ambient lighting? Um, Again, from an outcome-based point of view, if there's a large variety in ambient lighting, I don't know, perhaps something uh, like a vertiport near a major sporting stadium, then they would have to consider a range of intensities 
um, within their operating environment. So if it was game night, um, they may have to increase the intensity uh, during operations. And if it was uh, otherwise uh, not that busy, then they may be able to reduce it. Again, outcome-based specifications would allow for that flexibility. Um, and Rex, and now that you've asked this question, I remember there was another question I missed there earlier about the uh, the energy source of aircraft. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll tackle this question first. While CASA may not specify an aircraft's energy source application at a Verdi port, local fire safety professionals will be uh, more likely to mandate a visual marking be provided given different types of fire protection requirements. Um, Rex, this is uh, very much an issue we have deliberately not tackled yet. Um, we are working with other government agencies, both at the federal uh, and state levels, and then we'll work with uh, local level authorities as well to how to manage um, fire related standards, fire protection, fire response. Um, and they of course will have in mind um, all the different energy sources that potential aircraft may have, but this is definitely on our radar as well. Um, the other question of Rex's that I missed, in case you missed it as well, was uh, do these standards apply to other types of energy? Everybody likes to talk about EV tolls, but does it apply to um, hydrogen-based uh, fuel as well? Uh, yes, our VCA definition is just about the number of thrust units, not necessarily the energy source. I feel like I've been talking for a very long time, but I don't think it's been that long. Uh, so we still have a bit of time. If there are any more late questions, happy to tackle them. And I'm sure as soon as I say it's gone quiet and throw back to Liam, there'll be one there, but I'll do it anyway. Thank you very much, everybody, for your questions. Um, I hope we got your answers. Uh, if there is any more outstanding items, then you can definitely engage with us uh, through the consultation hub, which Liam's going to tell you all about right now. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so in conclusion, CASA has provided draft AC139V-01 guidelines for 30 port design for your consideration and for feedback. This has been the last of the information webinars, so hopefully we have provided some, or well, they have provided some insight into the AC. What we please ask now is for you to jump onto our consultation hub, find the Verdiport consultation and please fill out the survey. If you really love the AC just as it is, please fill out the survey and tell us that it works, hearing that it's good for the team's self-esteem. If there's something you don't agree with, please don't keep it to yourself. Let us know so that we can review the draft with all of the feedback. Additionally, just a reminder that CASA is inviting those interested to nominate to participate in the Verdiport Design Operations Technical Working Group. The intent of this TWG is to provide support and guidance on the future of regulatory framework for Verdiports. So please submit your application through the CASA Consultation Hub if you'd like to participate in this upcoming technical working group. If you have any more questions, please feel free to email the team at verdiports.casa.gov.au. Or if you'd like to have a chat in person, Dan will actually be at the Avalon Air Show, so go and find him at the CASA stand. Uh, sorry, Dan, I don't know what days you're going to be there. Hey, Liam, I'll be there on the 28th and the 1st. Awesome. OK, so on behalf of the CASA team, thank you very much for participating in our webinar series, and we look forward to maturing the CASA advisory circular with your feedback and your input. Thank you very much.